Well, welcome to our, uh, our first uh, panel. Uh, I'm Nick Lardy. I'm Vice Chairman of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations and a Senior Fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics in Washington. Um, we will, as Steve mentioned, be uh, briefly uh, interrupted when we get the live feed of the ringing of the bell at, uh, in about 15 minutes, so we'll, we'll have a slight pause then. Uh, we have two uh, outstanding speakers, uh, strong backgrounds in economics and uh, experience uh, in the private sector. Um, we're going to take questions at the end after we uh, hear from both uh, Yiping and Yao Yang, and um, that will give us more opportunity for interaction and uh, exchange uh, on the views that they are presenting. We're going to hear from them primarily on the uh, a more detailed analysis of the third plenum that Qin <coughs> Xiao introduced us to uh, in his opening uh, keynote. It was an extreme, I agree with him, it was an extremely rich agenda, a very, very detailed uh, document touching on uh, many aspects of economic, social, uh, political, uh, legal reform. And uh, we only have an hour, but th this will give us an opportunity to go into many of those issues in somewhat uh, greater uh, detail. So first we'll hear from uh, Yiping Huang, who is the uh, uh, Deputy Dean and also Professor at the uh, National School for Development at Beijing University. Thank you, Nick. Um, it's very nice to be back um, for the fifth year. Um, what I'd like to do really to, is to talk about the two points. Um, number one, how I see the economy may evolve um, in the next uh, seven years, given what uh, Qin Xiao just uh, described to you, the very comprehensive economic reform programs. And uh, the second thing I want to also try um, to perhaps draw some medium-term in investment implications, but it don't, don't, don't really uh, put me uh, uh, responsible if you lose money. Um, I should warn you first. These are more, more medium-term um, investment implications I try to draw. Um, so we have seen uh, the full script of uh, um, what I once described as uh, economics, um, the new economic policy framework of the Chinese government. And as Nick and uh, Dr. Qin Xiao mentioned early on, it's a very comprehensive reform program. It, in fact, uh, surprised the most uh, people in China, um, people who are working on the reform programs. Um, and it, it is uh, very comprehensive, including reform measures in 60 areas, a lot of them non-economic, but I focus more on economic issues. To me, two distinctive features stand out of this uh, whole package. Number one, top-level authority and a number two um, for market system. Top level authority, um, as mentioned earlier on, um, is symbol symbolized by the new, newly established leading group for um, comprehensive reform. Um, that is very high level, is probably the highest ever um, in terms of leading economic reforms. Um, I think the top level authority represents kind of partial departure from uh, the traditional bottom-up and uh, um, the so-called uh, uh, crossing the river by touching stone approach. So people familiar with, for instance, uh, the household farming system reform at the beginning of the 1980s, um, the, the practice actually started by farmers themselves and the government did simply reviewed the process and said, well, why don't we do it? in the rest of the country. So it actually was a tradition, typical bottom-up approach. Many of the reforms were like that, and this was why we call crossing the river by touching the stones. But the question then is, well, why are we changing the course? And one simple answer is many of the forthcoming reforms could no longer rely on um, bottom-up approaches, or in other words, there's no more stone to be touched. So for instance, if you're looking at the capital account liberalization, where is the stone? We don't know. So you need top level design. That's why I think the top level authority is important. The second reason why you need a top level authority now 
is because the reform now faces a lot more resistance from the vast interest group. Interestingly, in the past, the reforms were more about overcoming uh, resistances affiliated with the central planning system, but now you really need to overcome resistances created in the process of reform. So for instance, the monopoly of the state sector, they were not even as powerful um, as they today, the so-called state capitalism. Um, the state council issued a special document in 2005 or 2006 called the 36 articles trying to encourage private capital into monopoly industries. Five years later, the State Council announced another 60, uh, 36 article document, again to encourage the private capital into the state, into the monopoly industry, and it didn't really achieve much. And you could have your own analysis of why that was so difficult. And I think my own take is you really need authority from the top to overcome very strong resistance. That's why I think the top level authority is useful. The second very important feature of the reform program, in my view, is to complete the transition of the Chinese economy to a market system, which really started from 1930, 1978, um, I'm sorry. Um, I read the whole document. I'm not sure how many of you also read the document. But the single most important sentence in the whole document to me is the following. Wherever the market mechanism works in allocating resources, the state should never intervene. Um, that really is a fundamental change from the previous um, the approach of what you always say, the state and the market should work together. Obviously, that does not mean the state will no longer be proactive the state will still play an active role like in a market economy, but the state will play a role more in providing public goods and trying to overcome uh, market failures. So if only if, if even if only a portion of the 60 points measures are rigorous, is rigorously implemented, my expectation is that we should probably see a full market system a, the largest economy in the world, a high income country, and probably the world's most vibrant consumer market by around 2020. Um, that really is a big change, and I'm probably am optimistic than some other analysts. But I really believe we are in the last leg of the transition of the Chinese economy toward a market system and we are about to jump over the middle income trap. Obviously, there are still uncertainties in it. Between now and then, there will be lots of changes, obviously, but I think the central change, which I would focus a lot on, and I would certainly ask you to pay more attention to, is the change of the growth model. Um, lots of discussions about the growth model in the past, and uh, um, I'm not sure if you're familiar, but most Chinese are very familiar with the fact that there is a combination of number one, very dramatic economic growth in China. And that's why some people are very optimistic, but at the same time, you also had a very serious imbalance problem, inequality problem, inefficiency problem. So actually you can be very pessimistic. Even um, our former premier, once said that this growth model is uncoordinated, imbalanced, and therefore unsustainable. Um, but the, the optimism and the pessimism, actually they are two sides of the same coin. And for years I've been arguing that the reason why you have such a unique pattern of economic development in China is because of the so-called asymmetric liberalization approach in China. People all say, what really China did in the past was a, was a liberalization of the market system or, 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 or market-oriented reforms. But uh, my interpretation, my observation is that that kind of a reform was not a symmetric. Not a symmetric, meaning on the one hand, you look at the product market in China, um, agriculture products, manufacturing products, and the service products, 
for all, all those products, you could kind of could say prices are determined freely by demand and supply in the market. But if you look at the other side of the, of the economy, um, markets for production inputs or factor markets, like a labor, capital, land, energy, um, water, and so on, you actually see very serious and broad distortions in the system. And in most cases, I think you push down um, the cost of production. So if you agree with me on this, then you probably would agree that distortions in the factor markets are like subsidies to the corporate sector and the taxes on the household. Or in a, in, put it in another way, we are, while we've been li liberalizing the market system for years, um, there was a very special redistribution in, in mechanism built into the reform process. The policy has been redistributing income from household to the corporate sector, and to some extent also redistribute income from small to large companies. And that is why I think it explains why activity is very strong because they receive increased subsidies over years. But at the same time, the imbalance problems became more and more serious because the household in income grow much slower than um, the national income. But I think if you look at the economy, change is already happening, and this is what the, the policy reform is trying to achieve. Change is already happening um, with moderating growth and a rebalancing economy. However, so far I would argue the key change is tri triggering this, um, this transition is really the rapid wage increase during the past years associated with emerging labor shortage. Wage increase, I mean, labor shortage is still a controversial subject in China, but nobody, I think, at the moment really um, uh, 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 challenge the fact that the wages have been rising very quickly. And the wage increase cut into profit margins, investment returns, and even export competitiveness. That's why activity is slow. And external account surplus is also narrowed. So, I would argue the external sector um, rebalancing has already completed in a way. At the same time, when rap wage increases for the migrant workers, it improved the income distribution significantly because as most of you would agree, um, low income households rely on wage income while high income households depend more on investment returns. So migrant workers' wages increase actually was a positive for the low income household, not so positive for the high income household. That's why we are seeing rebalancing, we are seeing moderation of growth, and unfortunately this very positive change has not been recognized by many, but I think this is happening. But this is only at the beginning, and the wage increase is triggered by changes in the market, not really the policy changes. That's why I think the next step reform will be critical for completing the transition of the growth model. And personally, I pay a lot of attention on the financial sector liberalization because, number one, finance is uh, the engine of a modern market economy, as everybody would agree, especially we have to agree in this room. Um, second, at the same time, of all the distortions I once estimated in the factor markets, financial distortion was by far the largest and most serious distortion. So correction of that particular distortion will push the transition a very long way. But whatever it happens,
So this was very exciting. Um, <laughs> but what, 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 what will be even more exciting are the changes we're going to see in the Chinese economy. Um, <clears throat> I, I think the growth will continue to decelerate because the economy is maturing and we actually start to see sh shrinkage of the labor force. I think the inflation pressure will continue to rise because the cost normalization would mean the cost will rise continuously on very broad based, at least for quite a while. And I think income distribution will continue to improve due to not only wage increases and interest rate liberalization, but also more proactive government policies redistributing income. And I think the economic structure will become more balanced. Probably we're going to see more consumption, more consumption less exports, less investment in rel on relative terms. And I think economic industrial upgrading will accelerate because the cost increase will rapidly change the comparative advantage of the Chinese economy and also competitiveness across industries. So the only way to stay competitive is moving up the value chain. Um, otherwise, you will be pushed out very quickly. And I also think the Chinese economy will show much more volatile economic cycles going forward, that's simply a, main, a, name, a normal feature of a market economy. And that will affect, obviously, the way how China interacts with, um, the, with, the, with the rest of the world. So for instance, the Chinese contribution to global GDP growth will certainly continue to rise. But we should also be aware um, that the change will not only be one directional. When the Chinese growth take a steep downturn as a normal cycle, we could see adverse impact on the rest of the world and possibly trigger some recessions somewhere in the rest of the world. If China used to be a source of global disinflation, and I think that impact will be reversed, for quite obvious, re quite obvious reasons. And I mentioned that the Chinese industries will have to move up the value chain very quickly. That also could mean forcing um, very, very constant uh, um, new division of labor um, internationally in the rest of the world, creating new opportunities for low cost countries, but adding a lot of competition pressure for relatively high um, uh, tech uh, um, uh, countries. So there are lots of changes I think will take place, not only in China. The reason why we're all talking about the Chinese economy is because the Chinese economy is going to change, but that will affect not only us, but also you. Um, so to end my um, discussion, I would just say a few, something about my own take of the investment um, implications. What does that mean um, for investors? Um, I no longer work for investment banks, as I said, so um, if you like to listen, this is an academic advice. Number one, my number one advice is don't bet on China collapsing too easily, um, unless, you're, unless you're an economist. Don't bet with your money in any case, um, because for the past years, we have seen waves of warnings of crisis happening in China related to property price, shadow banking, and well, a number of others I really forgot, but uh, they're always, uh, after every three months, you hear these. That does not necessarily mean we should ignore risks, and as investors, we all watch out for the risks and the problems very closely. But at the same time, we should be very careful about the fundamentals, about the balance sheet, and about the reform momentum. So look at the risk is okay, but don't miss all, lots of investment opportunities. We have some very good economists in China who have been calling for bursting of property bubbles for the past 10 years. As an economist, I benefit from their insights, but investors followed their advice and lost 10 years of investment opportunities, I can tell you. The second advice is, well, I think we should also try to benefit from financial development in China. This is really a sea change 
And just the one particular example for you is the outward direct investment, which China is already the third largest outward direct investor, and it's rising very quickly. Um, according to one recent study by IMF, um, it suggests that uh, just to look at the capital account liberalization alone, that could contribute something like a net capital outflow equivalent to four to eight percent of GDP. That still hasn't accounted for what is going to happen with the growing Chinese economy. So lots of money will come out overseas. Now, whether you welcome the Chinese money or not, it's your choice. But I can tell you, if you don't particularly like the Chinese investment, it will go somewhere else. Um, number three, I think, what if I can find my notes. Um, number three is I think we probably should be very careful now if we still put our money with the monopoly SOEs. Those investments paid off quite handsomely in the past, but the things will change as the Chinese economy moves toward a more complete market system. And in particular, if you look at the, 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 the SOEs in the past, which have been doing well, enjoying benefit from the implicit subsidies and the government protection, that is going to change. The document uh, Dr. Ching mentioned that specifically said reform of the SOEs would mean the government will shift from managing personnel, businesses, and enterprises toward simply managing state-owned capital. And that will be a sea change. And in China, I think we have already start to see significant pressure on a number of companies like the big telecom players and so on. And my own view is um, the gigantic profits, the days of gigantic profits for um, companies like state-owned commercial banks are probably over. So just be very careful. Um, and my, my fourth advice is hold assets, whatever that will be in shortage in China, and particularly resources and, uh, and food. Um, obviously, land scarcity problem will not ease in China anytime soon. In the commodity markets, maybe the soup cycle is over, but China will remain as a major importer. Just be careful about the specific commodities you look at. But just to think, in the next seven years, China will settle or resettle 300 million people in the cities. There are some specifics if you're interested, you could look at, but this certainly is a very big story. My sixth advice is supply into the Chinese consumer market. This is going to be the most vibrant consumer market. It's not just about luxury goods, but about mass market. As average GDP per capita rises from 6,000 US dollars to 12,000 US dollars in the next uh, um, few years. And that will bring a significant change. And in particular, you look at the service sector. Service sector is about 42% of GDP is at least 10 percentage points below whatever you see in many other countries at a similar stage of development. So the service sector is going to see significant imp in increase in the next couple of years. And it certainly provide lots of investment opportunities. The Shanghai Free Trade Zone, I'm sure you've heard of one way or the other, is experimenting with um, the foreign entry into finance, into logistics, into healthcare, education, culture, um, accounting, auditing, anything you can think about. Um, I think if you are doing business in these areas and are you, if you're interested in the Chinese market, my advice is be there um, early because um, the lesson you, you, you learn is if you miss one step at the beginning, you will miss lots of steps later on. And uh, if you want an evidence, then I suggest you to look at the market shares of uh, Volkswagen and the Toyota in the Chinese automobile market. My last uh, advice is we should also try to ride on the technological upgrading um, train in China. Many people, including Chinese and foreigners, they all doubt Chinese ability to innovate. But in fact, what I would argue is last 30 years of 35 years of rapid economic growth is a process of innovation. And China actually is ranked the top um, in the world alongside Japan and the US. Whether you look at the total number of patents or you look at the ratio, 
of the number of patents relative to um, R&D. You have a num some of the Chinese companies like Huawei and Zhongxin are among the top five in total number of patents. They are actually big innovators um, in, uh, in the Chinese world and there are lots of things happening. Internet, for instance, is really revolutionized the Chinese economy. You look at the retail business, you look at the finance, you look at the publishing and so on. And I'll leave you with one number um, uh, to end. Um, E-commerce now is something like 6% of the total retail sales. If you think retail sales consumption is about 50% of GDP. And e-commerce normally has a 30% discount on the prices relative to the department stores. That e-commerce means efficiency gain every year at the moment of 1% of GDP. And that is the kind of innovation and the revolution we're talking about. Thank you. As I mentioned uh, at the outset, we'll have we'll take a few questions, time allowing, uh, after we hear from our second speaker, uh, Yao Yao. Uh, uh, Yi Ping uh, painted as uh, a quite a promising picture for China. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is a little bit on the downside, but, but uh, I want to warn you that I still remain optimistic uh, about China's economic reform. I just want uh, to highlight some of the uh, difficulties we are going to face uh, in the reform. Just uh, like uh, one question from the floor uh, mentioned uh, uh, Dr. Yi Gang's comments uh, on reform in China, uh, particularly the interest groups. Uh, you know, the, the reform plan is quite comprehensive and in many cases quite detailed. Uh, but um, we cannot underestimate the difficulties to carry out uh, those reforms. Um, probably on, uh, down the road, we can think about uh, several uh, forces that are going to be against uh, the reform. Of course, the first one can be interest uh, groups. Uh, for example, like uh, Dr. Yi Gang mentioned, uh, the export sector uh, may oppose to further liberalization of the exchange rate regime. Uh, but I think uh, uh, gradually more important uh, because China's economic reform has uh, gone deeper and deeper uh, and then we have to meet uh, the challenge of ideological shifts. Right? Uh, that's actually uh, quite uh, powerful uh, to many uh, extent. For example, SOE reform uh, some people say, you know, SOEs are quite difficult to reform because uh, the resistance of the SOE leaders. Uh, yeah, of course, uh, uh, that can be an obstacle, but probably more important is uh, uh, the top leaders uh, believe that SOEs can implement uh, the national, uh, national strategies, some of the key national strategies. So that kind of a mindset or ideology is very important in determining uh, the course of SOE reform. And third, uh, obstacle, um, and also quite uh, ignored uh, in the past, that's uh, the inability of government agencies uh, to carry out those reforms and also to take uh, risks. Uh, I, uh, let, let me then uh, using uh, my time to talk specifically uh, some of the challenges uh, in several reforms. Uh, let's first uh, think about uh, uh, the hukou reform. Uh, I remember I talked about the hukou reform two or three years ago here. Um, last, no, uh, two, almost two years ago, actually, the state council already launched a hukou reform plan. Uh, and the plan uh, was uh, actually uh, more broad, uh, bold, I'm sorry, uh, than the reform plan announced by the third plan. Uh, uh, it says uh, uh, people staying in small towns uh, can apply hukou uh, as long as they have stable place uh, to stay and a stable uh, job. And in medium-sized cities, 
uh, the, the, the requirement is three years. You have to live there and work there for three years. But if you look at the current uh, plan uh, for the medium-sized cities, it just uh, uh, reduced it to a where wed uh, sentence. That is, uh, those uh, cities can decide on their own. And for large cities, uh, the HUCO system is actually going to be strengthened. Right? But even uh, to, to implement this plan, this kind of watered-down plan, uh, there will be a lot of resistance. And we need uh, the central government to take actions. Uh, it's not like, uh, say, the family planning uh, uh, policy reform. Uh, the central government can just uh, re re uh, delegate uh, the task to provincial governments. But for HUCO reform, the central government has to take an initiative. But that's going uh, to be hard uh, from the several uh, talks uh, by top government officials, especially government officials from Ministry of Public Security, who's in charge of uh, the HUCO system. Okay. Uh, then, uh, think about uh, the rural uh, land reform. Uh, that's a big news. Uh, initially, people were so excited uh, by the reform agenda. Because uh, in the communique of the third planning, uh, it says uh, uh, farmers now can take uh, their agricultural land to the bank and use it as a collateral to get loans. Uh, that's uh, uh, re really exciting. Right? That, uh, for the first time in the last, let's say, uh, 60 years, farmers now really have uh, the property rights to land. Okay? And the second uh, uh, exciting news is uh, uh, residential land in the countryside uh, can be bought and sold directly in the market, which means uh, uh, farmers can take the land and then sell the land uh, in the open market. Uh, they, they don't need to sell the land to the government like they do now. That's going to uh, tremendously increase uh, the gains when they sell the land. Okay. So people got so excited, uh, and you can see in a, even in the financial sector, uh, people are excited, uh, and some of the trust funds have been established uh, trying to invest into agriculture. Uh, but uh, the last agriculture meeting, uh, uh, you know, um, just uh, rang the bell uh, to ask people to be more cautious. Uh, our President Xi Jinping uh, put the food security at a very high priority. And his famous saying that is, uh, we have to hold uh, the rice bowl in our own hand. Okay, so uh, we, have, we have to produce enough food for ourselves. And the collective land ownership has been uh, emphasized again. Okay, uh, so it's, you know, think about uh, uh, the reform initiative, the same as a farmer who wants to take a land as a collateral to a bank. Uh, if the bank uh, is rational, the bank is not going to take this piece of land as a collateral. Because if the farmer defaults, there's no way for the bank to cash in the land. The land is officially owned by the village community. So there's still a huge hurdle to overcome to implement uh, this uh, reform. I think that has a lot to do with uh, uh, the old ideology of collective land ownership. Okay. Uh, uh, think about uh, the financial reform. Uh, EP mentioned there will be huge opportunities in the financial sector. Um, but uh, to me, I, I think we should be, uh, probably should be more cautious on that. Uh, think about uh, the internet finance. It's a huge innovation, right? Um, especially uh, Zhifubao, you know, the Alibaba uh, 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 branch for, it's kind of the same equivalent to PayPal. Uh, use uh, customer money to invest elsewhere. Uh, legally, this uh, is actually uh, illegal, right? I mean, in legal term. But the government is allowing uh, for uh, Alibaba to do that. I think that's uh, a little bit risky. Right? If, uh, uh, there's uh, nothing wrong, uh, then the government will say, go uh, move on, we are not going to care about you guys. But if uh, there is a, a big default, then Alibaba probably will be in trouble. Uh, we have also other smaller uh, internet companies that, that are doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. 
So uh, that comes to uh, the key, I think the key uh, to the market reform. Uh, I, I mean, the, the famous saying, uh, whenever the market can uh, work, then the government uh, should retreat. Uh, but we have to have a concrete uh, mirror. And the most important one is uh, the so-called negative list. Right? Uh, uh, that is, uh, in currently in China, uh, you can only do what the government tell you to do. Right? If the government doesn't say you're allowed to do this, you cannot do that. Uh, but of course, in the U.S., that's the reverse. Right? There is a negative, a negative list. Other than that, you can do everything. Uh, so I, I think uh, the financial sector will become a kind of a test stone uh, for the negative list because. Uh, in the uh, community UK, negative list is uh, listed as one of the key reform merits. Uh, people look at uh, the Shanghai, uh, what's it, uh, uh, free trade zone. Uh, they are trying to adopt this uh, negative list. But if, when you read the list, you are going to be really disappointed because it's almost everything in there. So uh, China will have a long way uh, to go, especially in the financial uh, sector. Uh, this is also related to another uh, reform initiative for the financial sector, that is to open up uh, to domestic capital. I mean, uh, the Chinese financial sector has been opened up to foreign capital uh, uh, quite freely uh, to some extent, uh, especially compared with uh, domestic capital. Uh, today in China, we probably only have one uh, genuine private uh, bank Okay, o only one in, in, in Wenzhou, right? Uh, many companies, including Alibaba, have applied to set up uh, private banks, and many people expected uh, they could be approved by the end of last year, but of course nothing happened. So it still take a, a long way to go. I, I think uh, one of the key uh, obstacles to the, uh, this opening up uh, to domestic capital is, uh, the elisha uh, in the regulatory authorities, including PBOC, uh, they, they don't want to take a lot of risk. But it, it, uh, currently, uh, you can do things, but that's uh, legal or semi-legal, right? But if something goes wrong, uh, that's illegal, okay? We, you, you're going to be put in jail, probably. Uh, but uh, if they're made Ill illegal, then those uh, regulatory bodies have to take a lot of responsibilities. Probably uh, they have uh, not been ready uh, to do that. Okay. Uh, let's also think about uh, uh, the local central relations uh, Dr. Qing mentioned. Uh, this is a very important area. Uh, currently, there seems a mismatch uh, between uh, the revenue side and expenditure side. Uh, on the revenue side, the central government has 50% local governments have 50%. But if you look at the expenditure side, local governments uh, are responsible for 85% of the total government expenditure, and central government is only responsible for the uh, 15%. Okay. So man, many people uh, argue that the reform uh, should go to the direction that the central government hands more revenue uh, to local governments. Okay. Uh, but it seems uh, uh, the central government is not going to do this. Right? It's uh, controlling uh, the revenue is very important for the central government uh, to, uh, to regulate and control local, local governments, uh, in addition to control personnel appointments. Okay. Um, but uh, currently, uh, many people are arguing that since the central government is not going to give more revenues, tax revenues, to local governments, then we should allow local governments to issue debts, okay, formally. Currently, the uh, local government debts is growing fast, uh, but they're quite irregular. Uh, most of, many, many of the debts are issued by those so-called uh, financial vehicles, uh, SOEs, okay. Uh, so, the new initiative is to allow municipal governments to issue municipal bonds. Uh, personally, I think that's going to be quite dangerous uh, for two reasons. Uh, first, uh, China uh, has a unitary system. 
uh, which means that the central government uh, in the end will take up the bill if uh, some local government defaults. It's not like the United States, like Detroit, can just announce bankruptcy. Right? In China, that's impossible. The central government has the responsibility uh, to pay all the debts. So that's going to hugely di distort uh, the market signal. Right? Uh, the second uh, issue is uh, if you look at the, the, the tenure of those local government officials, on average, they only stay in one place for three years. And half of them actually stay there for less than two years. Okay. So if uh, I were a mayor, I would not care about the future. I would borrow heavily in my term, and in two years' time, I'm going to go to another city or even pr get promoted. Right? So because of those two uh, issues, I think uh, uh, if we go that direction, uh, we are going to see a lot of problems uh, uh, for uh, local deaths. I mean, one of the, uh, uh, the, 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 the purposes uh, to adjust, uh, readjust uh, local central relation is to curb the growth of local debts. Uh, and uh, it seems that we're heading to the wrong direction, okay? Um, last but not the least, if you read the communique, uh, there are a lot of talks about the economic reform, uh, but not many on uh, Gandhi reform, right? Especially at the local level. If you go to visit the local uh, uh, government, like the city government, the county government, and then you ask those uh, government officials, they're going to tell you uh, we are running the government like a company. Right? So, so local governments are players in, in, the, in the market to a large extent. If you look at the, the resources, local government control, that's huge. So without the change of the role uh, or function of local governments, uh, I really worry about whether we can establish a true market economy. Because you have uh, such a big uh, player that has uh, really solved the budget constraint, uh, not responsible for what uh, it's doing. Uh, that's, uh, uh, I think that's uh, the biggest uh, challenge. It seems uh, uh, the communique has not uh, put enough uh, uh, emphasis uh, on this uh, issue, okay? So uh, w with that, I want to emphasize that I still remain hopeful for, uh, for reform, like Dr. Ching mentioned. Uh, when we push forward for economic reform, and gradually we are going to find that we need to reform other things, especially uh, on the government side. And hopefully uh, uh, that will happen uh, in the next five years. Thank you. Well, our two speakers have given us uh, a lot of uh, ideas. Uh, they're complimentary and they have some, maybe some uh, different perspectives. So uh, the floor is open for questions and I'll start with uh, Jeff Schaefer. Jeff, thank you. There were two. Microphone. Two outstanding presentations that we've gotten used to having at these early January meetings. Uh, both of you talked about the central importance of the need for financial reforms and part of the overall market reforms. But you didn't explicitly put it the way I've been coming to think about it. As I look at the Chinese economy, I go back to uh, Janos Kornai's observations of 40 years ago, that without a financial system that limits the resources available to individuals, to companies, to governments, you do not have a tight budget constraint and therefore prices don't mean anything. And I see a lot of what's going on in China today as many parts of the economy, the SOEs, the local governments, some people not facing a tight budget constraint because of the financial system. Is this a core part of what needs to be addressed or do you have a different view on it? Um, definitely. Um, I, I think the financial liberalization um, it actually has a very um, comprehensive program, sub-program in the document. I think it includes eight, eight, 11 areas, but specifically it's about 
um, inward and outward opening, um, interest rate, exchange rate, and uh, um, the, um, the risk-free yield curve, um, reform of uh, um, the, the, the um, financial intermediation really is about the increasing direct financing as a proportion in the total uh, financing, freeing capital account liberalization, a uh, capital account, um, and also um, in approving a financial um, uh, monitoring. I think the point you mentioned is probably reasonable. Um, the question about uh, um, soft budget constraint. On this particular point, I probably will share more with uh, um, Yao Yang, who just uh, said, I mean, my own view is the biggest risk going forward is the soft budget constraint for the local government. Although the government did say in the document that we need the transparency of the local budgeting, and that would pave some way for uh, improvement, but uh, um, I agree with Yao Yang. It really to, 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 to eliminate the soft budget constraint problem for the local government, you need kind of a political reform where the, 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 the authority is from, whether you need to be accountable for not only GDP growth, not only the, um, the, the fiscal position, but also the balance sheet. Um, that's something needs to, to be happen. But I'm more optimistic on financial liberalization. For instance, if you liberalize the interest rate and exchange rate, I think the behavior of the market players will be very different. In particular, the SOE reform, if it's implemented as, um, as described in the document, the SOEs will be very different. Um, as I mentioned, the, the government wants to change the way it manages the SOEs from previously, they really manages everything about the company, personnel, business, and enterprises. The new model is to just manage the state-owned assets. Now, it may be not a very good way of describing it, but if you're familiar with the Tamasek model, um, you get some kind of a sense how the government want to manage SOEs. Obviously, they still will treat the different types of SOEs differently. But if we move, as I said at the beginning, halfway slow, that kind of reform pass, we'll see significant changes. Um, but obviously, financial liberalization, Jeff, you're a, um, a, a, a very experienced uh, um, industry expert. Um, it always comes with risks when you liberalize the financial sector, so we should be careful. But I'm still optimistic that we are moving in the right direction. Uh, 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 I think Jeff asked a very important question, on, uh, local, especially on local governments. Uh, I mean, um, probably, uh, the 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 ma uh, let me put it in this. Uh, the, the way to solve ultimately solve this problem is to have a true federal system like the United States, right? But that seems out of the question, right? Uh, so we 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 cannot go that direction. Uh, but with that, probably the next best is to strengthen uh, local people's congress and make uh, those uh, uh, local government officials to be accountable to local people. Right. So if you borrow heavily, then uh, the people are not going to allow you to do that. Uh, but that's going to take a long, long time. In the communique, uh, there are sentences uh, saying that we should uh, strengthen uh, local people's Congress. But I think that's a, that's a long way to go. So the in the, uh, 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 in the short run, uh, probably what the government can do is uh, first to regulate those uh, uh, financial SOEs. No more uh, financial vehicles. And then probably we should ask them to close down, uh, gradually, most of them, okay? Uh, and second, uh, it seems that uh, local governments are going to issue municipal bonds anyway. Uh, even you know, many people are opposed to that. Uh, then uh, we still need uh, the central government to monitor that currently. The Ministry of Finance has to approve uh, those bonds. I think we should continue on that and probably use uh, more strengthened rules uh, to regulate uh, the insurance uh, of uh, those municipal bonds. Uh, Dan Rosen. Thank you very much. Terrific presentations. Dr. Chen said that the reform program is designed to support growth at 6 to 7 percent. 
annual GDP growth rates. In previous years, the central government has put out a growth target for the coming year, any time between December at the end of the work conference and the National People's Congress. Given the thrust of reform to remove the government's uh, sort of role in engineering a GDP outcome, as we've seen in the past, do you expect that we won't be given a growth target for 2014? If we are given a target, will it be in Dr. Chen's 6 to 7 percent range? Um, I don't know, um, but I think uh, um, my reading is that they still will announce a target at, uh, um, at uh, the uh, National People's Congress. I will say this. Um, my prediction, this is actually I borrowed from some economists. I predict the target will be 7.5%, and uh, my suggestion, my recommendation is 7%, so I will always be right, or whatever number they, 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 they publish. <laughs> but I think my own, my own sense is um, two. One is I do think uh, the current growth potential is probably still between 7 8%. So whatever numbers we look at, um, I think uh, um, still, still very decent numbers. But I also feel that uh, um, the bottom line numbers the government is putting out last year, 7.2%, I think it's a way too high. The, way, the reason why it's a way too high is because the, we used to argue that we needed to create uh, jobs so that uh, the society will be stable. But the 8% number, as you probably heard about it before, was put forward in 1998 during the middle of the Asian financial crisis. That's the time when our labor force was rising by 8 million a year. Last year or the year before, the labor force declined by 3.5 million. So that's why growth dropped to 7.3% in the second quarter. There was no major unemployment problem. So my own sense is uh, target, it's okay, 7.5 or 7 doesn't matter. But uh, the bottom line probably should be lower so that you can have more scope to push ahead with the reforms. That, but that's that much more short term. Can I take a I think I saw some hands in the back. Why don't we go? Uh, my name is Stephen Sachs, and one area that wasn't touched on was the investments made by the government. And uh, last year I saw a figure that the uh, government was the, still the largest holder of, of our United States uh, Treasury uh, uh, instruments, and of that, s part of their asset allocation was 6% devoted to uh, equities. And I'm just wondering if, if that's an area that uh, you could touch on, if if the allocation is going to change, is, if still they're going to be purchasing a number of treasuries, are they going to be buying more equities, or are they going to go to other natural resources like gold, for instance? So I'd appreciate the answer on that. Thank you. Um, obviously, um, that is a question for Egon um, <laughs> instead of for me. Um, we, we don't really disclose very explicit like any other sovereign wealth fund. Um, but if you look at uh, the, the, the performance, the guesstimates of the composition of the investment, um, the Chinese government has been, or the, the, the central bank has been diversifying away from the U.S. treasuries for quite a while until when we realized most of the diversification didn't really work out. Um, the Euro zone investment, the emerging, mar emerging market economy, and so on. So um, I don't know specifically what they're going to do, but my, my sense is the following two points. Number one is I think there is a consensus view now that we have built enough um, foreign exchange reserves just for financial stability purposes, and that's why I think central bank will probably be more cautious or reluctant to intervene aggressively by more foreign exchanges, so the pace of accumulation will definitely slow. Second, then, with the money, where you go? Um, if I'm a central banker in charge of investment at the moment, if uh, maintaining financial stability is the key purpose, then I guess I would still actually look at the U.S. Treasury market. Uh, whatever the risks you see there, it still is a better option than many other markets uh, um, available at the moment. I, I saw another hand in the back, or in the middle. 
right? Yeah. Good morning, Stuart Bradley. Thanks for taking my question. When I think about the tribulations of multinationals, namely the investigations going on, uh, I think of a Chinese idiom, Sha Ji Ge Ho Kai. Kill the ch chickens to scare the monkeys. The monkeys being the SOEs, the chickens being the American companies. Do you see any evidence of that? And can you comment on the, uh, the activities in relation to multinationals and really that being a game to get the SOEs in line or not? Thanks. <laughs> this, this is a hard question. Um, is, uh, look at uh, those uh, several kind of high profile cases. Uh, um, most of them, uh, in, uh, uh, I suppose, in food, uh, food industry and the drug industry, right? Uh, so probably that that has some it's kind of a flavor, as you said, the shaji ge ho kan, right? So that that can uh, uh, I, I don't know uh, increase uh, the probability of persecuting those uh, domestic uh, companies, um, but. Um, I, I don't want to overread uh, <laughs> those, uh, you know, very isolated cases. Hmm? Yeah, here in the front. Um, thank you for both of your wonderful presentations. Um, I have a question for Dr. Huang, because in your speech you mentioned this changing the growth model and also the indispensable corrections of the financial distortions in the marketplace. So I wonder if you think the recent interest rate spikes and also the widespread presumption that uh, the money market rates were maintained at a higher level than in the past is related to this growth model change or is more like the seasonal change in the like fiscal deposit injections or Working flow. Thank you. What is your last point? Um, like whether the, the, the rising money market rates related to the change in the growth model or it's more like a seasonal change, result um, of seasonal change of the. Well, I'm sure we have uh, market economists here later <coughs> in the next uh, session. Um, they can talk about it more specifically. Um, my reading is this third, the, re the reason why we are seeing this uh, um, spike. Some people describe as a pure mistake by the central bank. Uh, I see some deliberate uh, element in the in the in the policymakers' intention. Um, the, um, the, the 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 top uh, uh, policymakers have been talking about the, the need to deleverage in order to reduce the financial risks. So um, the only thing I could uh, say is obviously you can't maintain um, the interest rate at a too high level because that would lead to collapse of economic activities. But the policy message is clear that we need to maintain them at a reasonably high level so that you would be able to squeeze some of the bubbles and the speculative activities. Whether that is leading to the desirable result at the moment, I don't know. But we, if, we, if the government is serious about reform, as it says in the document, then we are in for a ride maybe to the brighter future, but in the between there will be some pains that we have to take. This is a significant departure from the reform approach we saw last uh, uh, year. Well, I want to, I think to stay on schedule, we need to draw this session to a close, and I hope you'll join me in thanking our two panelists and uh, getting us off to a good start. Thank you. Thank you.